Greetings, welcome to Electronics 2. This is lecture number 26, and I am Bezad Rosari. Today we will finish up our study of frequency response by going over some additional examples just to exercise our understanding that we have developed so far and apply the skills that we have gained to analyzing uh, new circuits. So we're going to start with the MOS cascode. I mentioned that last time in the context of the bipolar cascode and I said they are similar. So we might as well go over the MOS cascode and analyze its response. And then we will go to a common source stage with current source load. This is something we have seen in electronics one at low frequencies, but now we want to study its high frequency behavior. Then we'll talk about cascaded stages, which should not be confused with cascode stages. And then finally, we will revisit the concept of FT. And this will conclude our study of frequency response. Okay, so here's what we covered in the previous lecture. Uh, one interesting uh, result that we discovered was that the output impedance of the source follower or the emitter follower, I meaning if you look out here and we set the input to zero, uh, becomes inductive for some frequency range because the magnitude of this impedance goes up with frequency just like an inductor does. So we said this is inductive behavior and in some cases it is actually useful. We can use this type of circuit to build an active inductor which is uh, like an inductor except that it does not use a physical inductor. So it occupies much less area on a chip. Uh, then we also talked about the concept of FT, the transit frequency. And we said FT is the frequency at which the current gain of the device drops to 1. And this is applicable to pretty much any device. Here I have shown it for a MOS device. Now, when we studied MOS devices in Electronics 1, we said that the gate doesn't draw any current. So if I try to apply a current source here, at very, very, very low frequencies, I get a very, very, very high voltage here, right? Because the current is multiplied by an infinite impedance. But because we are interested in high frequencies, we know that's not true because at high frequencies, the transistor capacitance is coming to picture. So there will be a CGS here, and there will be CGD. So the current actually does go through these capacitances and it generates some finite small signal voltage here. So we did a calculation for MOS or bipolar and we saw that uh, the frequency at which the current gain drops to 1 is approximately given by the transconductance of the device and CGS or CPI if you have a bipolar device uh, if we neglect this capacitance CGD for the MOSFET and CMU for the bipolar device. Okay, so this is a nice little equation to always keep in mind. Of course, FT is just this div divided by 2 pi. All right, so today we will extend some of these ideas and we're going to start looking at the MOS cascode. So let's start with the MOS cascode and see what it does. All right, so here's our standard MOS cascode structure. And again, we have a resistance here, which models the output resistance of the preceding stage. It's not something that we add deliberately here. And our input goes here. Uh, this goes to a bias. So for small signal calculations, this is AC ground. And then this is the output. We have some resistance here, RD. And we have M1 and M2. <clears throat> okay, so we would like to uh, find uh, the frequency response of this circuit, which means we would like to find the poles and maybe the zeros, at least the poles, because those are more important. All right, so remember the procedure that we described earlier. The procedure says first, draw the circuit, then drop in all of the capacitances of the transistors. 
So let's go ahead and draw all of the capacitances in here. We have uh, CGS1 between gate and source of M1, so going to ground. Then we have CGD1, CGD1. Then we have uh, two capacitances from the drain and the source going to AC ground. So this would be called C drain bulk one. And there is a C source bulk one. Okay, so four caps per MOSFET. All right, this guy, same thing. So we have CGS2 between the gates and source of M2. Then we have CGD2. So we have CGD2 between the gate and drain of M2. And then two caps from source and drain to substrate. So one cap from this source to ground, which we will call CSB2, source bulk. And then one from here to ground, which we call drain bulk 2. CDB2. All right, so those are all the caps that we have. <clears throat> now, if the circuit drives another circuit and that circuit has some input capacitance, we can always add that input capacitance to this one, right? This is the ground. The input capacitance, by definition, is to ground. So these can be merged to, into one capacitance. All right, in the third step of our analysis, we see if any of the capacitances can be merged or removed. So let's go and see what can be merged. All right, so I'll change the color of my pen. Uh, CGS1 is CGS1, we cannot merge it with anything. Same with CGD1. How about CSB1? CSB1 goes from ground to ground, so that's gone. Okay, CDB1 goes from this drain to AC ground. How about CGS2? CGS2 goes from this drain to AC ground, so these can be merged. How about CSB2? That also goes from this drain source connection to ground. So all these three caps merge into one. So let's cross this out, let's cross this out, and let's just add them in here. So we have CGS2 plus CSB2. <clears throat> okay, great. Uh, what else? We have CD, CGD2 from the drain, from the output node, to VB, which is AC ground. And then we have CDB2 also from the output node to ground. So I can cross this out and just add it to this one, CGD2. All right, so we managed to get rid of a bunch of capacitances. Now the circuit is simpler. Okay. So we would like to try to find the poles by inspection, right? So let's write that here. Find the poles by inspection. And as you remember, the procedure was that we go to every node in the signal path and we find the total resistance from that node to AC ground we find the total capacitance from that node to AC ground, multiply, invert, that is the pole frequency in radians per second. All right? Okay. And we saw that the complication is, occurs when uh, we have a capacitance that doesn't go to ground, like this one. And the answer to that was to try to use Miller's approximation. Okay? So that what we're going to do is apply Miller's theorem to CGD1. Okay, well, so CGD1 will be decomposed into two capacitances, one going from the input to ground, one going from the output to ground. The one going from the input to ground would be CGD1 times 1 minus AV. AV is the voltage gain from here to here. So let's draw the circuit quickly again, because it's a little crowded and it's easier if we redraw it and make it cleaner. So we have V in RG and M1, VB, M2, RD. 
and V out. Okay, so I have some capacitances that are already going to ground, so let's just draw those in uh, to uh, make the situation simpler. So here are some caps. CGS1 goes to ground, so that's good. Let's see, I'll draw it like this. That's CGS1. And then I have CDB1 plus CGS2 from this node. So CDB1 plus CGS2 plus CSB2 uh, plus CSB2. So that's great. <clears throat> okay. And then at the output node, we have CDB2 plus CGD2. So here we have CDB2 plus CGD2. So that's all we got. The only one that is not accounted for is uh, the CGD1. So let's apply Miller's theorem. So, uh, so we apply 1 to the input, which whose value would be CGD1 times 1 minus AV right here. So it goes between these two nodes. So one goes from here to ground, one goes from here to ground. So let's add another one here. And we call that CGD1 times 1 minus 1 over AV. If you, if you remember, that's what we got from Miller's theorem. Okay, so we just have to find AV. AV is the voltage gain from the left terminal of the capacitor to the right terminal of the capacitor. CGD1. So we call this node A, we call this node B, and this AV that we're looking for is given by VA, VB over VA, right? The small signal gain from node A to node B. <clears throat> okay, how much is that gain? All right, well, let's uh, look at the circuit carefully and see what's going on. I have a signal at node A. Okay, that's going to the gate of M1. The source of M1 is at AC ground. And of interest to me is the signal at the drain of M1. So this would be a simple common source stage. For such a common source stage, I can write the voltage gain as minus GM of the amplifying device, M1, times the resistance that we see at this point to AC ground. Now, if we neglect channel length modulation, then uh, looking down, we see infinity. Looking up here, we see 1 over GM2, right? We are sitting, looking at the source of a MOSFET into the source of a MOSFET with this gate at AC ground at low frequencies. So that would be 1 over GM2. So this is multiplied by the resistance that we see in the drain. So it's just minus GM1 over GM2. OK. All right, that's great. In the case of the bipolar cascode, we derived the same equation. And we said because the transistors have the same collector current, the same bias current, the two GMs are equal. So that gain was minus 1. The gain from here to here was minus 1. Minus one. Uh, how about here? Can I say that GM1 and GM2 are equal? Well, not necessarily, right? Because we know that we can write this like this. GM1 is, here's one equation that we have, right? 2 mu n C ox W over L of 1 times ID1 divided by uh, the same equation for M2. So that's 2 mu n C ox W over L2, ID2. So these GMs are equal if the numerator and denominator are equal. IDs are equal. The same bias current flows through both transistors, so that's fine. But then we also have this W over L of 1 and W over L of 2. So in the general case, these two GMs are not equal, so this gain is not equal to minus 1. But in 95%, 99% of cases, actually, we pick the same dimensions for these two transistors. There is really no reason to make these have different dimensions. 
So we say in most cases, W over L of 1 is the same as W over L of 2. So that means that AV is equal to minus 1. All right? Okay, so then that means that this capacitance becomes 2CGD1, just like to get bipolar case, CGD1, and this also becomes 2CGD1. All right, so we got all of the capacitances to ground. We have resistances to ground. We can go ahead and find the pole frequencies. And again, just like the bipolar cascode, we have three poles. One at the input here, one at this node, which we might call the cascode node, and then one at the output. So let's just write out the pole frequencies. That should be easy, right? <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to write them here. Omega P A, the pole frequency associated with node A, is 1 over... The total resistance that we see at node A to AC ground. So this independence source will be set to zero. So looking this way, I have RG to AC ground. Looking this way, I don't have any resistance. So it's just RG. So that's RG. And then the capacitance, which is CGS1 plus 2 CGD1. So CGS1 plus 2 CGD1. Okay, that's simple enough. And one key result that comes out here is that if I compare this cascode structure with a simple common source stage, so here's a simple common source stage, and we look at the Miller multiplication of CGD1, we see that in this case, the Miller multiplication would be CGD1 times 1 minus AV, but AV is GM minus GM times RD. So the voltage gain of the stage from here to here could be large, could be maybe 5, maybe 10. So CGD1 gets multiplied by 6, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 11, something like that, as opposed to only 2. Okay, only 2 here. So that's the key advantage of high frequency performance of the cascode over the simple common source stage, right? The Miller multiplication is much less in this case than in this case, just the way we talked about for the bipolar cascode as well. All right, so we see that this pole has only two CGD1 here, but if I write it for the simple common source stage, this would be 6, 7, 8, 10 CGD1, right? All right, let's move on to the pole at the cascode node. Again, uh, this pole, omega P B, is given by 1 over the resistance that we see at this node to AC ground. How much is that? From here. Well, looking down, we see infinity because we have zero channel length modulation. Looking up, we see 1 over GM2. So that's all we have. So 1 over GM2 times a whole bunch of capacitances, right? We had this one, this one, this one, and then this one. So all of these add up in there. Okay, so we have C, uh, DB1 plus CGS2 plus CSB2 plus 2CGD1. So that is the pole frequency at the cascode node, at this node. <clears throat> All right, the, the last pole is out here, so that would be RD multiplied by this capacitance, right? So we can say omega P out is equal to 1 over RD times CGD2 plus CDB2. Yeah, and that's the third pole frequency. And just like the bipolar cascode, here uh, this pole at this node is pretty far, so usually we're not worried about this pole much. Uh, so we end up with really two poles, one here, one here. And one of these two will limit the bandwidth of the circuit, uh, probably this one, okay? Because there's also 
some other capacitance that we have to drive in the next stage. So it's not just this plus this times that, right? So there's more. All right, so this is a, an analysis of the high-frequency response of the cascode MOS structure. Uh, the key point here is that, again, the Miller multiplication of CGD1 is less when we have a MOS topology, uh, uh, cascode topology as opposed to a simple common source topology. All right, let's move on to the next example. So, let's see here. <clears throat> so the next example is, as I mentioned, the uh, CS stage, a common source stage with current source load. All right. So we know that sometimes instead of a simple common source stage with a resistive load, we prefer to have a current source here so that the voltage gain is higher. That's the motivation, right? Okay, so let's do that. Let's uh, analyze that. Here's a PMOS device acting as a P-type current source uh, coming from VDD to the output node. And our amplifying device is here. We have a resistor again, not because we like it, but because this represents the output resistance of the preceding stage. And then here we have a bias voltage, which comes from a current mirror to properly define the current of this device. So let's call this M1, call this M2. Okay, so we would like to find the frequency response of the circuit. In fact, I'm going to go to the next slide because I need more room for this one and something else that will come shortly. So let's just go to the next slide and draw this out. Okay, so I'll just draw that again here. You don't have to draw it again. Here is the structure that we have. <clears throat> M1, M2, and VDD up here. And this is the output node. Okay, so our first step is to draw the circuit. Our second step is to drop in all of the capacitances, four per transistor. All right. Well, uh, but by now we have enough uh, understanding that we know in some of these capacitances won't count anyway. So it's, we should be able to tell right away. All right, so I have CGS1. CGS1, great. I have CGD1. CGD1. And I have two caps, one from drain to AC ground, CDB1, one from source to AC ground. But that's uh, not unimportant, right? Because it goes from ground to ground. We won't even bother drawing it. Okay, how about M2? M2 has CGS2 from here to here. Should I draw that? No, it goes from AC ground to AC ground. So that's out of the picture. Uh, we do have C, G, D, 2. Okay. And then we have two caps from the drain and the source of M2 to substrate, to AC ground. Okay, so we have one cap from here, which we call C, D, B, 2. And then we have one cap from here, which would be C, S, B, 2, source bulk. But that goes from ground to ground, so again, that's out of the picture. So it's very simple, right? We ended up with only four caps instead of, well, only uh, uh, five caps instead of eight caps, right? Okay. So, um, some of these can be merged, right? Which ones can be merged? Let's look at that carefully. So again, I'll go to my black uh, line uh, from the drain of M1, we have CDB1 to ground. We happen to have CB, CDB2 to ground as well. So we cross this out and we write 
CDB2. And then we happen to have CGD2 to AC ground also. So we write CGDD2 here, and we cross this out. That's great, all right? So now the circuit has only three capacitances. And in fact, that circuit can be easily analyzed because we analyzed this before, remember? We analyzed this stage with one cap here, one cap here, one cap here, right? So that circuit is the same as the circuit after we eliminated all these capacitances. All right, so the only tricky thing is that here we call this RD, right? We had an explicit resistance. Uh, but now here we don't seem to have an RD. What is the resistance at the output node? So let's think about that for a second. Well, obviously I cannot assume that uh, channel length modulation is neglected because then I end up with an infinite resistance for this and infinite resistance for this, right? The circuit would not be very meaningful. Actually, in more advanced courses, you can see that it is still meaningful, but here it's not really meaningful. So let's assume that lambda is not zero and then proceed and see what happens. Okay, so I'm going to redraw the circuit with only the capacitances that I have left and then explicitly show the output resistance of these two transistors. So here we go. We have M1, RG, V in. We have CGS1. We have CGD1. We have the upper resistance of this guy, R01. Then we have a cap, which is all these three, CDB1 plus CDB2 plus CGD2. All right. And then I have M2. How do I model M2 in the circuit? M2 is a current source. Is VGS is constant. If the VGS of a MOSFET is constant, its drain current is constant. If the drain current is constant, then uh, the dependent current source inside the circuit will be zero, right? Doesn't have any small signal changes. So what's left over of M2 is just the output resistance of M2. So M2 is just RO2, and it goes to AC ground. Right? If you draw the small signal model of M2, you will see that the gate source voltage is zero in a small signal model, so all is left is RO2. So now I can see that this begins to resemble this, right? All we need to do is place RO1 in parallel with RO2, right? Then that's the, that's the equivalent to this RD. Okay, that's great. So now we can uh, try to uh, apply Miller's theorem to this capacitance so that it breaks into two. If you don't like that, we already have the general expression for the transfer function of this circuit. So that transfer function equally applies here. Okay, so let's try to apply uh, Miller's theorem to CGD1. So what I would like to do is uh, uh, break CGD1, so I want to get rid of this and put one here, we call it CGD1 times one minus AV. And then we also want, want to add one here, which would be CGD1 times one minus one over AV. AV is the low frequency gain from the left plate of CGD1 to the right plate of CGD1. And that's the approximation that we're using for Miller effect, right? Okay, all right, well, how much is AV? AV is uh, the voltage gain from here to here, right? So AV is equal to, I, I'm interested in the signal at the gate of M1, and then this signal at the drain of M1. So M1 again acts as a simple common source stage. So the gain would be minus GM1 times the total resistance that we see at the drain to AC ground, which is RO1 in parallel with RO2. 
So R01 in parallel with R02. Okay, so then that's good, right? So I can write this as CGD1 times 1 plus GM1 times R01 in parallel with R02. That's this capacitance. So you can see that now CGD1 experiences significant Miller multiplication, right? This is a GM R01 in parallel R02 could be a reasonable number, 10 maybe, maybe 20, something large, right? So that's uh, worrisome, right? We have heavy multiplication of this. It becomes a large input capacitance. All right, and then this one at the output be becomes a CGD1 times 1 minus uh, or plus GM1 R01 in parallel with R02. Now, this is sort of good news, right? Because if GM times this is a large number, this is a small number, so CGD1 gets multiplied by about 1. All right? It doesn't become a large capacitance at the output node. Okay. All right. So if I perform this approximation, now I have one pole here and one pole here, and that's easy, right? So again, I'm going to write, let's write, call it omega P in, the pole at the input frequency at the input. <coughs> that's uh, 1 divided by... The resistance that we see, which is Rg to ground, after this independent source is set to zero, times all the capacitance that we have, CGS1, and then this, Miller multiplication of CGD1. So CGD1 times its Miller multiplication factor, GM1, R01 in parallel, parallel with R02. All right, that's the input pole of the circuit. <clears throat> okay, that was easy. How about the output pole? Well, the output pole, again, is obtained by the resistance that we see, which is R01 in parallel with R02, times all of this capacitance, right? So omega P out is equal to 1 over... Uh, R01 in parallel with R02 times all of this, CDB1, CDB2, and then CGD2. And then the Miller, uh, the Miller effect of CGD1, so CGD1 times 1 plus 1 over GM1. R01 in parallel with R02. So that is the pole at the output of the circuit. Okay. So you see that uh, with some simple approximations, we managed to analyze the circuit. Uh, at the beginning, it looked a little complicated, right? You have two transistors, so many capacitances. But just step by step, we simplify and simplify, and eventually we end up with some simple expressions. So that's very helpful in estimating the performance of a circuit before we try to analyze it more accurately. All right, so that is the analysis of this little circuit here. Uh, let's see if I have another uh, example. Okay, so let's talk about... Uh, <clears throat> cascaded stages. So cascaded stages means stages that come one after another. Okay, that's different from cascode. So here's an example. Suppose I take a common source amplifier and it has some gain, right? So M1 RD1. And that gain is not enough. So we know a bunch of tricks, right? We can convert this to a current source or cascode and all that. But yet another trick is to say, okay, I'll just use two stages. So I have one more stage here with, a, with RD2 and then M2, right? So that's the out 
and this is uh, again we have an RG here for a general model V in that's also a good amplifier right uh, you have two gain stages so the gains now multiply if this has a gain of 5 and this has a gain of 5 the overall gain will be 25 so that's another way of building an amplifier with a higher voltage gain so now our objective is to analyze the frequency response of the circuit okay all right so what do we do we don't panic right we just go through our procedure our procedure is very simple we uh, know that uh, uh, the first thing to do is drop in the capacitances so let's go ahead and do that uh, actually I have to change my color to maybe black this time all right so M1 has uh, CGS1 and then CGD1 CGD1 uh, two caps from drain and source to substrate so we have C uh, db1 the cap from the source to substrate is goes from zero ac ground to ground so that's out of the picture and then similarly for m2 we have cgs2 and then here we have cgd2 and then here we have again cdb2 right the sources are grounded so those caps go out of the picture we have three cap per capacitor per MOSFET so we have six capacitors okay uh, any of these caps can be merged yes uh, these two this CGS2 goes from this node to ground this CDB1 also goes from the same node to ground so we can just add these two together right so let's do that let's cross that out uh, now that we are here so we'll cross this out and just write it as CGS2 here. The other caps are there. And the troublesome caps are CGD1 and CG2, CGD2 because they do not go to ground. So we have to apply Miller's theorem to both of these capacitances to convert them to grounded capacitances. All right, it's an approximation, of course. Okay, no problem. So. How much is the voltage gain from here to here? GM1, RD1, minus. So let's cross this out. And let's add another capacitance to ground. And we'll call that CGD1 times 1 plus GM1, RD1. All right. OK. Uh, there's also the effect of CGD1 at this output node from Miller's theorem. So I will just add that here, right? I'm too lazy, so I won't draw another capacitor. I'll just say CGD1 times 1 plus 1 over GM1 RD1. Okay. So that's these two take care of the Miller decomposition of this capacitance how about CGD2 well we have the same thing so we cross this out and we have to draw a capacitor from here to ground to model the Miller multiplication of CGD2 but this capacitor is already to ground so I'm going to just add it over here so we say CGD2 times 1 plus the voltage gain from here to here GM2 RD2, GM2 RD2. And then we have to take care of the Miller decomposition of this capacitor at the output node as well. So that would be just CGD2 times 1 plus 1 over GM2 RD2. All right, so now all of the capacitances go to ground, so we can readily find the poles. How many poles do we have? We have one pole here, one pole here, and one pole here. So we have three poles. All right, so let's write this out. Uh, we need some names. Uh, we can call this the input pole. That's okay. This uh, has a, should have a name, so we'll call it a node X. So let's change the color. 
to blue, call this node X, the node between these two circuits, right? Okay, so the pole at the input is given by 1 over this resistance, that's the only resistance we have to AC ground, times this capacitance plus this capacitance, right? So we've seen this a number of times in the past for a simple common source stage. So, sorry, I have to clean this up. <clears throat> okay, CGS1 plus CGD1 times 1 plus GM1 RD1. That's the total capacitance we have from this node to AC ground multiplied by the resistance, which is RG. So that is the pole at the input. All right, the pole at node X. So omega PX. One over. How much is the resistance? Just RD1, right? There's nothing else. So RD1 times the total capacitance. It's this whole thing, right? All the way to here. So CDB1 plus CGS2 plus CGD1 times 1 plus 1 over GM1 RD1 uh, and then plus CGD2 times 1 plus GM2 RD2. CG2, CGD2 experiences Miller multiplication and it comes down to ground and loads at the previous, previous stage. Okay, and finally we have a node at the output. We have a pole at the output, omega p out. So 1 over. The resistance is just RD2, so we write that down. And then the capacitance is this plus this. So CDB2 plus CGDD2 times 1 plus 1 over GM2 RD2. Okay, so that's the, these are the three poles that the circuit has. All right, uh, so the important point here is that uh, when we encounter a circuit like this, again, we follow our procedure, right? And then at some point, we have to make some approximations. Otherwise, we say we're stuck. We, if you write the small signal model, it becomes a very large circuit. At the end, we end up with this very large equation and doesn't tell us much, right? We can't really predict trends. We can't try to optimize the performance of the circuit. But when we do this, at least we have a better understanding. All right, let's go over one more example. We have a little bit of time left, and that has to do with the FT. So, FT revisited. All right, so we saw that for a MOSFET, FT is given by GM over CGS. Uh, uh, I can say divided by 2 pi, right? Omega T was GM over CGS. And last time we said to maximize FT, what we would do is we would maximize the current, but not play with W over L. But let's just see what happens if we do, if we do play with W over L. So, what happens if W over L is doubled? Consider two cases. A, ID is constant. And B, ID is doubled. Right? These two. Okay, so I'm going to write this as square root of 2 mu n c ox w over l id divided by 2 pi cgs. Case number one, we increase the width by a factor of 2, but id is constant. Okay, so when we increase the width by a factor of 2, this goes up by a factor of 2, this goes up by a factor of square root of 2, and id is constant. So FT goes to FT over square root of 2. So FT goes down. But in the second scenario, if we double this one, 
and we double this one, the net result is doubled, right? And this is also doubled because the width of the transistor is doubled, so FT does not change. So FT goes to FT, okay? Because GM went to 2GM, and CGS went to 2CGS, all right? So if we want to keep the FT of the device constant, and uh, we want, for some reason we have to make it wider, we also have to increase the current. If we increase the current and the width together, then FT remains constant. FT does not degrade. This concludes this lecture. I will see you next time.